We've had the biggest bull market in U.S. history, painted and uh, created by financial excess, free money for about 10 of the last 15 years, money was free. A lot of decisions were made based on free money, uh, commitments by corporations, debt commitments, personal family commitments, mortgage commitments, all kinds of commitments that people, the corporations, governments make based on the assumption that money is cheap and gonna stay there. Well, that's been ripped off and now suddenly those errors are exposing themselves. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoff and I'm the at JR Mining guy on Twitter and your host of this channel. And I'm really looking forward to welcoming back Michael Oliver. He's a chief analyst and founder over at MSA. And uh, we interviewed him about five months ago and he has been spot on in his analysis. So I'm really looking forward to getting an update from him. How much momentum is left in the stock market? Uh, I always sound so negative here, but uh, we, we have to be realistic. We have a Fed cut coming up uh, here in about three weeks or exactly three weeks as we're recording this. So we'll have to make up our mind, like where is this going to trend? And uh, maybe Michael can shed some light on that market situation for us. But uh, before I switch over to my guest, please hit that like and subscribe button, leave a comment. It helps us out tremendously reaching a wider audience and uh, we can bring guests like Michael on more frequently. So thank you so much for that. And now without much further ado, Michael, it is great to have you back on the program. It's good to see you again. Good to be back, Kai. Yeah, lots to discuss. We briefly chatted and uh, we've got lots of topics to run through. But uh, let, let's start with a more general question, Michael. And uh, how strong or vulnerable is the economy right now? Well, I think it's uh, going to be very weak. And usually the stock market will lead overt economic weakness. Now, we've had a lot below the surface that the Fed is, you know, oh, no, the economy's strong, job market's strong. And I, everybody knows that was baloney. And now suddenly uh, with the huge revision in the job numbers going back the last year uh, all those numbers were bullshit you know so who can believe any of the numbers frankly if, if that one was a uh, so far off target but anyway it was very weak and the fed is going to cut there's no question and the the issue for the stock market though is when the fed cuts after a period of let's say rate rises and then pause you know, we, we rose, uh, took rates up a year or so ago, and then they paused for a good period of time now. And then they, they'll follow with a cut. Okay, the same thing happened in 2000 to 2001. They ceased rate rises in the uh, middle of 2000. They started cutting rates in January 2001. Okay, then the next time we had a period of rate rises and then pause it was 2006, big long pause till 2007. They told us, oh, there's nothing wrong with the mortgage market, Bernanke said. It's uh, totally manageable. And then in September of 2007, mid-September, S&P was about uh, 2% off, of what the high, 2 or 3% short of what the high would ultimately be. They cut rates by half a point, and it was a shock and surprise. Not like this time around. Everybody anticipates it, and they're correct. The Fed has said they're going to do it. Back then, it was an ambush. And Wall Street quotes that I've gone back and looked at from uh, various financial sources were absolutely surprised. They were having champagne and cookies, one guy said. <laughs> and uh, it was a Christmas present. No one expected That's what another guy said. So anyway, but what happened then is the market went up for three or four weeks after that cut. And that was the top. <laughs> and it went to hell for the next two years, despite the fact that the Fed cut rates all the way down. OK. And back to that 2000, 2001 period. In January 2000, the first day and then the last day of the month, two cuts in one month, they started cutting rates. The market had a little brief hiccup rally, and then the collapse really began, and they cut rates all the way down. So anybody who's applauding the notion that the Fed's going to cut rates, uh, go back and look at history. <laughs> okay, the last two major bull market tops, you could have circled the point at which they cut rates, give or take a bit, and uh, a bit, that's all. And you, you would have shorted the high. So there, you know, that's what history says. <laughs> I think it's the same thing this time. And I think the data points will start to collapse. Why? We've had the biggest bull market in U.S. history, painted and uh, created by financial excess, free money for about 10 of the last 15 years. Money was free. A lot of decisions were made based on free money. Uh, commitments by corporations, debt commitments, personal family commitments, 
mortgage commitments, all kinds of commitments that people, the corporations, governments make based on the assumption that money is cheap and going to stay there. Well, that's been ripped off. And now suddenly those errors are exposing themselves or expose themselves the more as time goes by, where suddenly commitments were made based on several, several fundamental assumptions, the one primary being what's the price of money. Okay, so anyway, those errors will show themselves in ways that heck, I can't even predict. I mean, it won't just be one area like it was back in 2007, eight. It was the mortgage market. This time it's likely to be broader and likely to be in areas people aren't even thinking about because the bull market was a seven to 15 fold, depending on S&P or NASDAQ, like that's like triple to quadruple any prior bull market. And it lasted about three times longer than any prior bull market. So it's a massive bubble. And when it breaks, there'll be massive bubble breakage with all kinds of fundamental factors in play. Uh, so that's, that's, I think, what's going to drive the market down. But technically speaking, the market, I think, is topping. It's actually, if you'll stand back and look at some of the key indices, you know, they were up, they dropped in July, they came back up. But if you go sideways for about three months, you can cut through the ink it's really been doing nothing for about three months. A lot of volatility, but going nowhere. So I think we're in a topping zone. S&P is probably going to make a new high. It stopped just short, you know, this week of making that new high. NASDAQ 100 is not at the, or not, or near the new high yet. It may not make it. But I suspect in the next week or so, and certainly by the time of that rate cut, you'll see the topping action occur. And there are certain breakage levels below that we've got using long-term momentum that say, if you pull back, I'll give you an example. Uh, NASDAQ 100 dropped to 17,500. It's rebounded now to 19,500. Its high was over 20,000. You drop halfway back to that low any time in the next quarter, meaning what, 20 some odd trading days, you're in next quarter. And I'm going to blow quarterly momentum floor that is very much resemblant of 1987 momentum floor. <laughs> so put, put that in perspective for us, Michael, like what was that? What's the momentum floor there? Like give us a, well, maybe a price indication what that could well, look like. It's, if you're looking at price, you see this upward action. And it's hard to even draw a multi-point trend line. I mean, you can connect two lows, but it's hard to even connect three lows on a price chart because it's sort of curved. So technicians really have a problem right now saying, where, where, where do we don't want to go? You know, where's the breakage point? It's hard to define. When you look at quarterly momentum, you have a flat floor for the last two years. Whereas every time you drop the NASDAQ 100, which is the leader index, outperformed the S&P vastly over the last 15 years. Uh, it's dropped down to its three quarter moving average, which on our momentum charts is dropping down to our zero line on our oscillators. You've done it three times now. You touch that line the fourth time, you're going to have a quadruple bottom breakout. And that's down around uh, 18,500 area next quarter. It could adjust a bit. But that's a halfway between where we are now and where we were at the low last month. Uh, so it doesn't. you don't have to go back to that low to blow that structure. And when you do, you have the same kind of pattern that you had in 87 and actually similar to what you had in 29. Now, I happened to catch the 87 crash it's before I found it MSA. I can catch it in a big way, but it caught it enough to smack me in the face to tell me this is a tool that's useful. OK, <laughs> we've got the same structure now on NASDAQ, and it's kind of rare to get this kind of structure, this clarity. So I think there could be some speed, not right away, not next month, but maybe in October onward. Um, and I think at that point, people will realize, my God, Fed rate cuts don't help. They're trying to hose down a fire that's the biggest fire they've ever set because they created the biggest bubble they ever had. Anyway, it's going to be interesting. Well, lots to follow up on, uh, Michael, here. And I want to stay on the Fed real quick. We briefly okay. talked before hitting the record button about uh, 25 basis points versus 50, and you used the word uh, ambush. And uh, for me, a 50 basis point cut uh, seems almost like an ambush because the market right now, 64.5%, yeah. is expecting 25. Mm -hmm. The question is more of the signal as well. If he cuts 25 basis points ahead of the U.S. election as well, maybe yeah. to throw in another factor in here. But uh, if he cuts 50 basis points ahead of, uh, in September now in about three weeks, what, what does that mean? Like the market well, it means he's really concerned about something. It means he's yeah. definitely concerned about something. 
because they've they've uh, effectively written off their inflation issue and said, okay, that mandate we, we're taking care of that. Forget it. Okay, our focus now is the economy and damage we may have done, and we don't want to wait. He even said, I don't want to wait until we've done the damage, until the data points hit him in the face, and then they cut. He says we need to cut ahead of time. So he announced this like a month ago. So there is no surprise this time with, with the rate cut, unlike in the 2001 or especially the 2007 rate cut, where people were absolutely, the investors and analysts were surprised by it. And therefore, they bought into it. The problem is, and it lasted for several weeks, the problem this time is they've already bought into it. Since the low we made a month ago, shortly a week or two after he made those statements, the market soared back to its highs. Dow made a new high, S&P's likely to, you know, a big deal. But they've already done their buying based on the rate cut. So it wouldn't shock me that if they, when they cut rates, there's almost no response this time. Now, of course, if you're an investor and you believe that they cut rates, it's bullish for the market and the market doesn't do much. What are you going to think? You think, hmm, what's happening here? How come it's not going up? Well, you've already discounted the rate cut. That's the problem. And uh, but I do think we're going to hang around for certain technical reasons. I think that any attempt to sell off right now is not likely to take hold. You're more likely to bounce back up from this recent lull we've had and possibly even make a new S&P high, which is not not a lot above you. And the vulnerability won't hit until you maybe get in after the rate cut. Now, you, you mentioned he's nervous, and I, I found a quote yesterday when I was uh, preparing for another interview, and uh, it's like, we do not seek or welcome further cooling in labor market conditions. And uh, also, inflation and labor market data show an evolving situation. As you said, like, that sounds nervous to me. Like, like that's clear language that something is broken, although the yep. numbers don't reflect it yet. Yeah, right? no, they, the speeches by the Fed governors make it clear that they see some data points that maybe we don't see or... Who knows? You know, again, do you even trust the data points? <clears throat> they know what's going on. I think they finally realize that things are weakening. Uh, I mean, some of the major corporation layoffs have been enormous lately. You know, we've heard a lot of stories about you know, this, not just in the restaurant business, but uh, in the, uh, the commu uh, computer business. Uh, Intel's laid off tens of, the, you know, et cetera, et cetera, kinds of headlines like that. Uh, and so they're aware of that. Um, and if they cut by 50 basis points, and that tells you they're really aware, they're scared, okay? And if they did a 25 basis points, that's probably too relaxed. And I'm going to suspect they're going to do 50. Besides, we probably get some data points between now and then that they can latch on to as an excuse. I know it's three weeks is still a ways out. Like, it's almost yeah. premature to have that discussion. But at this point, as of today, Michael, what, what is priced in? 25 basis points or 50? I have to think 50, maybe. I think 50, probably, yeah. yeah. Um, they've made it abundantly clear they're going to cut and that they're concerned about something. So I think the, the knowledge of 50, you know, and yeah. they're doing it right before the election, of course, looks kind of awkward for them, but it, so they can't wait. <laughs> they did it any, you know. It's, um, anyway, yeah. So, no, I think about 50 basis points. But then the real shock is going to be, well, what if the market doesn't really respond to that? That's because it's already has responded to that. Uh, and then that's when if you're long based on that assumption about a soft Fed going forward and it doesn't work, then you start to scratch your head. So some of the other markets, let's talk bond market, maybe U.S. dollar to a degree as well. Just uh, looking for market indicators, what is priced in and uh, okay. bond market yields have come down, meaning bond prices have gone up. But also the Dixie has, I don't know, for lack of a yeah, better term, yeah. crashed to almost no, no, 100 it's, points it's now. Down nice, like, yeah. Yeah, it crashes a bit of an extreme word here, but uh, it's come down, as you said. Um, it's corrected down to 100 points, roughly. Um, are those other indicators of, uh, you know, the Fed yeah. cutting rates? Is that exactly what you're looking for? Gold and silver and the miners broke out above annual momentum basing actions as of March of this year. In other words, I had momentum structure overhead, like the floor I described on the S&P below that you, you're likely to break. Momentum floor I'm talking about. Gold had a ceiling above it, and it broke through it. And that's where gold gushed above 2,000 and shot up now to 2,500. Silver went from, you know, 20 bucks to 32, you know. Um, <clears throat> it's now just below 30. That occurred then, but when I looked at the other major asset categories, like the bond market, U.S. T-bond market, dollar index, they were, the dollar index was holding a bait, it was holding a floor on its quarterly momentum, 
that we defined as being broken at 104.40 about a month ago. This is cash dollar index. It's now down under 101. It's 100.50, I think. So it's dropped, not crashed. It's just it's just oozed down fairly significantly. And I know if you break 100, you're going to have a lot of price chart technicians start to scratch their head and say, oh my gosh, you know, this is topped out. We think it's topped out. So we've had the bond market was doing the opposite. The bond market, if we plotted our momentum oscillator, quarterly momentum again, where you plot monthly action in relation to a three-quarter moving average, it was confined below a ceiling. There was a shallow ceiling, not a floor to break, but a ceiling to break out above. You broke out above that a month ago. Bond, T-bond futures then were just above 120. Right now we're trading, we've been up to 126. And we're trading 124, 125 areas. So they broke out of a quarterly momentum base to the upside, lagged to the gold breakout that it registered in March. So again, we have two big asset categories that broke out upside based on our long-term momentum. And we thought the bonds should do that. Why? Not because the Fed's cutting rates. We're talking long into the debt market here. It's because asset managers begin to reallocate assets out of that which they perceive to be higher risk, less reward, into something lower risk, more reward. And that would be the T-bond market. Whereas a lot of them perceive the stock market to be less reward, higher risk potential. Now they have to be long because they're competing with other asset managers. And if you're not long and it's going up, you, you lose customers. But there's a lot of suspicious asset managers out there who are ready to make that shift. And they've already begun to. You can see it both in the T-bond upside action. You can see it in the stall in the stock market. And you can see it in the gold surge that we've had since late March. So there's been some asset class shift out of those three categories. The dollar foreign exchange, major foreign exchange, again, the dollar is inverse of the primarily the euro and the yen. That comprises like 70% of it, of the dollar index. <clears throat> It has been dead as a doornail for almost two years, where after that collapse we had in 2022, we were up at $115 index. We collapsed down near 100. And since then, since early 2023, the dollar has more or less gone sideways in about a single percentage range, up, down, up, down, but going nowhere. So it was a non-event. It was the quiet one, we called it. Watch out for the quiet one sitting in the corner. Okay. It broke its quarterly momentum to the downside. Again, so another major asset category that where quarterly momentum is looked at as, your, as our trend assessment, it is now freshly broken to the downside. So again, gold upside, March. A couple of months later, bonds upside. And over the last month, dollar downside. The only one that's waiting is again, what I described with the NASDAQ 100, the floor underneath quarterly momentum on the stock market. That's the last one to complete, and I think it will, meaning break to the downside. That means all those four major asset categories will have decided their new direction. In this case, we're talking long gold, long T-bonds, short stocks, short dollar. That's how we see the, the mix right now. now since you brought it up, we, we do have to talk a little price targets. Curious what your, what the charts are telling you in terms of momentum. Let, let, let's start with the precious metals here, Michael. Um, gold, we're trading at 2510 roughly right now. Um, silver as well, you mentioned just below 30. Like, what, what are the price targets in those scenarios? I don't really have one. But what I'm going to tell you this, I've said this in many interviews over the last year, and people think I'm predicting this. If you look at the last couple bull markets in gold, the mid-1970s to 1980. Gold was in a fixed price in the 30s. It went to 850, you know, 1980. And then from a 2000 to 2011, 10, 11 year bull market went from $260 to 1920. You had eight fold moves, eight plus fold moves over the span of a decade, let's say, or somewhat close to a decade either side. Well, we made a low in 2015, December, just above 1,050 gold. We've now doubled that and a little bit more. 2,500. So we're nowhere near the metrics of the prior bull markets in terms of what is the, the multiple gain over the span of, let's say, a decade. We're nowhere near close. If we match those, merely matched the geometrics of those moves, would be $8,000 gold. And so people, well, that's outlandish. Well, I mean, you know, it's nothing. You're repeating history. <laughs> and right now, we argue you've got 
more powerful, potent, technical and fundamental technicals out there in these other major asset categories to help drive gold, meaning drive the central banks into panic and therefore drive gold to the north in a big way, possibly even much bigger than an eightfold move. Isn't there, it's like Michael, isn't there even a Fibonacci extension that goes to 8,000 that sort of predicts well, that? I'm not, I'm not an I don't expert. Know. I'm, so. not a, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe there is. Okay. Uh, I, I, I know some analysts that I respect, some fundamental guys who, who think he'd go in the 20,000s. And, I, you know, I don't know. Right now, my main focus on gold and silver is the following. I think while we're going a lot, lot higher over the next year, let's say, I mean, a lot, you know, maybe even 8,000 gold, uh, I think silver could be a couple hundred dollars an ounce. These aren't my projections. They're a statement of uncertainty, but clarity of the direction and likely potency. It's likely to be enormous, breathtaking. But I think there's about to be a surge in the next month or two that could be breathtaking in itself. No, not get us to 8,000 gold, not get us to 200 silver, but get you somewhere so fast that people are yanked into a new sense of reality. Where silver, for example, suddenly blows through its dual highs it now made at $32. You went to 32, back off to 29, back to 32. Then you went to 26.50. Then you back up to 30 recently, up ticket. Tick, tick, tick. You get back to 32 a third time, and I'll bet you're going to break out and hit 33, in which case your price chart guys are going to say, my gosh, all my skepticism, I got I to gotta forget it. We're going up. I think you could get a white knuckle flight going through those recent highs. It takes you well beyond the 50 level. Now, I'm not saying to go to 100, 200, no particular thing. I think there's a time frame here that's probably more important. And I think that if you do start to engage more to the upside, uh, gold's already done quite a good job. But silver, for example, getting back up to close to, to 32, let's say, then we're about to engage over the next month or two after that, meaning September, October, into some levels that may shock people especially in the speed at which you get there, such as taking out the old dual highs at 50, for example, going to 55, let's say. Uh, I could see that kind of move occurring quickly. But then <clears throat> from a trading point of view, especially if you're in call options that have expiration dates and you're leveraged futures, let's say, if we get such a surge, it's time to maybe think about uh, we're, we're focused on this. Think about maybe shifting out of leverage into perhaps bullion equivalents, unleveraged position. Uh, because, you know, you could get corrections along the way. And I think we're going a lot, lot higher over the next year. But the next few months could be quite dramatic in themselves. Not that that's the end of it, but it could be a shocking next phase. And I think similarly, if that occurs, you're probably going to be seeing the stock market do what I said, which is to say go down and blow out its quarterly structure. Now, a point about that. If you look at the day-to-day -day action in this, the S&P and NASDAQ and look at silver, for example, or gold, you, over, the, over the last few weeks especially, you get a down day, they're down. Everybody's down together. Like today, they're all down together as we're doing the interview. If they get an up day, usually they're all up together. So people have this thing in their mind that, oh, if the stock market goes down, like you say, won't that hurt gold and silver? All I could say is historically, yes, there was a time that occurred. That would be October 2008 when there was a full year after the stock market had peaked and gone down. There was a crash type moment in that bear market a year after the peak. Gold joined in for about four to six weeks with the stock market, then reversed and went back up again while the stock market continued on down. Uh, so people have that burned in their memory as, oh, that's what's got to happen. When you go back and look at 87, gold went up about 9% during the crash week in the stock market. So that didn't work then. If you go back and look at the 29 to 32 era, there was no gold trading, of course. But Homestake Mining was the biggest you know, gold miner out there. It went off the page on the upside during that Great Depression. So don't necessarily assume that if the stock market gets some panic selling, let's say, as you get into October by breaking the quarterly structures I defined. But the silver and gold could be goosed on the upside. Why? Their primary driving force is monetary deterioration. And you can bet if you throw into the mix, the stock market starting to break hard, along with data points going with it down the loo. You know, that, that's when the data points really get bad, when the stock market goes down. For some reason, that tends to be the history. The Fed's going to go absolute panic. And they've already told us they're going to shift trend. And you can bet the ECB will be right with them. 
And so it's not just going to be U.S., uh, though we're the most vulnerable because our stock market is the biggest bubble in the world. No other market looks like it. But if they panic, that means what? Monetary deterioration, artificially lower than real market rates. That's what fuels gold over time. Michael, since I have you, and it's fresh on top of my mind here, August 5th, of course, and I'm sure you've had a fun day at the office there as well. But uh, the, the market panicked, stocks dropped, gold dropped. Is that yeah. the perfect case study for what you just mentioned? Is that something we well, should yeah, be referring to? Like, does sync, that fit the mold? Well, on a short-term basis, sometimes they're in sync. But when, you know, when we run, uh, I talk about quarterly momentum. Sorry to confuse you folks. When we run monthly momentum, what we measure is against a three-month moving average. Not just overlaid or in a price chart. That's meaningless. That's noise. But we oscillate price in relationship to where, where's the three-month average this month? Where is gold price in relation to that? Is it above it, below it? And if we plot it on our oscillator. If you go back a year and plot a monthly momentum of the S&P or NASDAQ, and go back a year and plot a monthly momentum bar chart of gold, they're in total opposite sync. The stock market is trying to top its monthly momentum Gold has been pulling back since an April peak reading high. And we know we've got the 2450 back in April. Now, price has gone marginally higher, but momentum has corrected downside. While price cooled off, momentum had a benign pullback. But the momentum readings dropped while the S&P readings were going up. Ever since almost a full year ago, you could put these charts on a page and you'll see they're total opposites. So, yes, the day-to-day -day action sometimes tells you, oh, they're in sync. When you look at monthly momentum, they're totally inverse. And we're more focused on that. So I think a lot of people are going to be fooled when the stock market rolls over and regenerates some fear. But if gold doesn't go with it, you're going to have a lot of people fooled and therefore surprised. And what does surprise create? <laughs> Sometimes panic. In this case, buying panic in the case of stocks. I mean, in case of the gold market. So anyway, so don't don't have that in your mind too much, the synchronization, because they're really out of sync. No. There's more of a rush to liquidity as well, I, I would say. To yep. question, like it goes in tandem, of course, but then gold, if, you know. If sort you of have a liquidity issue. Now, we had one, you know, with the, the Japanese situation, you know, a month ago. But usually it's my experience, whenever you get one of these, quote, accidents that suddenly appear, some people anticipated it, of course. When you see some of these accidents occur and people are trapped in a position that let's say is leveraged but based on certain other factors that have suddenly come into play and it ambushed them. If they're in vulnerability, you know, their company could go under if they don't act, they're going to act. And so I think a lot of the panic or the liquidity issue was taken care of then. In other words, we took a lot of pressure out of the pressure cooker with that panic that we had. So that issue of the very rapid panic in the stock market. I don't think you're going to have that so much, even if you break this structure of the quarterly momentum, which does look like 87, but you don't have to do an 87, meaning 30 something percent in two weeks. Okay. You, you might do 20% over three months. You know, a crash is something very dramatic, very rapid. In fact, the last time we had a crash in the U S market, by the way, I'm going to point this out was the banking crash in March of 2023. The stock market had already made its low in late 2022 and was trying to turn up. But the banking sector in December of 2022 was near a high. And we put out a report in, in January of 2023 warning of a potential bank sector ambush. And I'll be damned, the, the KBE, the ETF of the U.S. banks, crashed starting in March. So about six weeks after we put out that report, it hit our trigger number. And it actually dropped 30 plus percent in a matter of several weeks. So we did have a crash event in the stock market in banks. And the stock market reflected it to some extent. It only dropped five or 10 percent, the S&P, whereas the banks dropped a full crash mode, uh, 30 plus percent rapidly. Gold went up during that time. So did silver. So you actually had a bank ambush. It, it surprised people, it surprised the Fed, surprised investors. It didn't surprise gold and gold went up during that time. So, again, here's a recent example of a crash event in a particularly important sector, and gold went up while it went down. So, again, separate yourself from that idea. Sometimes it's valid, but most of the time it's not. No, I like that, and uh, appreciate the clarity there, Michael. Um, talking about momentum, and uh, 
there's roughly $5 trillion sitting in money market funds accumulating, what is it, 5% mm -hmm. or so. Have you seen that money move? Is like, is there I, momentum I in that capital? I don't watch that. I don't watch okay. that, frankly. Uh, <clears throat> but I think when these events occur, you will see movement. And I think there's some wise asset managers who are not gold bugs, you know, who uh, Stanley Druckenmiller, for example, back in mid-February said he was going to dump a bunch of tech stocks. Well, if you look at the big key tech stocks he dumped, he pretty much hasn't missed anything. You know, they dropped, they came back up, but basically he got out a pretty good time. Okay. And at the same time, he bought Newmont Gold, the biggest blue chip gold miner in the world. You know, it produces more gold by 37% than the second biggest miner, which is Barrick Gold. Newmont then was trading around $31, $32. Right now it's trading at $52 six months later. He's still pretty good. And I think that was largely, I, I can't get into his mind, but I think it was probably a sense that, hey, you know, higher risk, less reward stock market, less risk, more reward monetary metals, and especially a beaten up major gold miner like Newmont was. So Newmont's got up 60% in six months. Pretty good move. <laughs> and it, in recent, we had these flinches in, in the gold mining sector over the last week or so, you know, down a percent or two or three, and Newmont doesn't even flinch. <laughs> so you're, you're right on the asset reallocation issue. And I think you've seen it in the T-bonds as well. They're now moving inverse to the stock market, which is something we expected to see happen, uh, where I think you're getting that 60-40 portfolio mix, you know, the orthodox thing, 60% stocks, 40% bonds. That was a disastrous concept in 2022. They both got smashed, huge. <laughs> bonds were down more than stocks that year. But this time, the technicals justify that relationship back to normal, where bonds t long, long into the debt market is a safe place to be relative to the stock market. Now, I make another point. We've recently done a study on other long end dated bonds, like municipal bonds and high yield corporate debt. And don't confuse them with T bonds. So if you're long T bonds, is a place to be. Don't be long high yield corporate debt and don't be long munis. They look like they could go with the stock market. And they look like they've broken on a relative performance basis. We've done a technical study of their relationship. And all the time since, for example, the COVID low in 2020, mm -hmm. if you look at the spread relationship between muni bonds and T-bonds, muni bonds outperform T-bonds. High yield corporate debt outperform T-bonds. That has technically changed abruptly over the last month or two in terms of the breakage of that relationship. Coincident with the time that bonds broke out upside, these guys didn't, and the spread is collapsing now, which also, because that spread relationship tends to look like the movement in the stock market, which since the COVID low has basically been up, we're betting that the breakage in that debt spread, disfavoring munis, disfavoring high yield corporate debt, is also a negative background signal for the stock market. No, no, absolutely there. And uh, you, you teed up the next question for me perfectly, Michael. You, you brought up Newmont, and we do have to talk about the miners. And uh, you mentioned Stanley Druckenmiller buying into Newmont. He also bought some Barrick. Uh, he exited from tech, which is interesting. Yeah. Like he sold his tech position, and maybe we could talk about base, base metals and commodities and recession indicators here in a second as well. But mm -hmm. I want to stay on the miners real quick. Like, what, what, what do the charts tell you if you look at the GDX, GDXJ? They, like, they, what, what, what does that look like? They're vastly, we all know this, they're vastly undervalued historically. Okay, now I will say this, though. They were vastly undervalued back in 2015. In other words, if you ran a spread chart of, let's say, you, the XAU index of gold and silver miners, it's been around since you know many decades, so you can go back a long way and study it. Its price of XAU in relationship is a, expressed as a percent of the price of an ounce of gold collapsed since 10, 15 years ago. So it was back in the 2000 to 2011 period. It was at very high levels. And since then, in the, in the 2015 bear market in both in the metals and the miners, where they both went down in net price, the miners went down more than gold. But since late 2015, and this is hard to believe, in other words, if you bought the low in gold at 1,050 or 1,100, let's say, in fact, we got bullish at 1,140, February 2016, haven't changed since. <clears throat> and you look at where XAU index was or GDX was and where it is now. Despite the fact that the miners are still below their 2020 rally high, 
like GDX, it was $45. We're trading at 38. Okay, so well below the 2020 high, which goes above that by $500. But look at the spread where GDX was in relation to gold in 2015. It's up a lot more than gold, despite its seeming weakness. Yes, it's been weak over the last year or two, especially. But it's starting to reassert itself. And I think the miners are about to become a place to be relative to gold once again. And this time, they're doing it from levels that are historically very cheap. And I think that's what some major asset managers also realize, is that while they like gold, they see the miners are vastly undervalued, especially the big blue chips. You know, they're, they're probably don't fool with the juniors. And that's why you've seen the tonal behavior. For example, look at Agnico Eagle Mining, AEM. It's at its all-time highs. All-time highs. Okay. Newmont's reasserted itself in a big way. I think there's money movement, and it's probably by large asset managers, not little gold bugs. And it's persistent. In other words, they don't care whether you get a down day in gold or not. They're buying the miners, as we've seen that tonal difference. I think over the next year or so, you're going to see miners, again, vastly outperform gold. I like that. I like hearing that because a lot of my portfolio is in, of course, in that niche. So and yes. my, my viewers know that, of course. Um, I brought up tech and uh, might as well stay on that topic for a second um, as an example for maybe selling recession. What's the, what's the opposite of unproof yeah. stocks? <laughs> oh, <laughs> like uh, recession the, stocks. The NASDAQ right? like, 100 is the place to watch. We call it the leader index for obvious reasons. The S&P went up seven to eight fold since its 2009 low over a 15-year period. NASDAQ's gone up twice that much, gone up 16, 17-fold, NASDAQ 100. Well, what's the NASDAQ 100? Well, you could about 50% of the entire weighting of the 100 stocks. No, uh, my, Michael, I th I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry to jump in. I meant tech with a K at the end. So the tech mining stock. So he oh, sold I'm tech, so a sorry. copper oh, producer. So yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, oh, I yeah, had to, yeah, had to jump sorry. in okay. real quick. Yeah, okay, but no, we okay. can talk about tech as well in a second because no, today me, NVIDIA is reporting. Talk about so basic commodities now. Okay, let's talk about that. Real, real quick, yeah. yeah. Bloomberg Commodity Index isn't really in sync with gold. It hasn't been historically. Like, you know, when did the Bloomberg explode recently? Late 2020 to 2022 when the war started. That's when it topped. Gold at that point was pulling back. Gold had already had its surge in the summer of 2020. And commodities were at their low, and then they served. Now, since then, commodities have pulled back halfway. Now, let's talk about base metals, for example, copper. Copper soared to an all-time new high recently, got up over $5. This would be like silver being over 50, okay? Copper did that. It got above its prior two highs, the 2011 high, the 2020 high. It's pulled back down. It's low fours right now. I think it's probably going to hold here and go back up again. But the Bloomberg Commodity Index looks like it's going to join gold now and be in fairly good sync with gold, like it was 1978, 79, during the great stagflation. So I think that looking at the base metals right now in particular, uh, they've had a pullback along with the Bloomberg. They're pretty much in sync with the Bloomberg Commodity Index. We think Bloomberg is basing here. It's about halfway back to its 2020 low, so it's had a 50% correction since early 2022. Most of that going sideways for the last year or so, really. And copper looks like it'll be a full participant in that. So the recent pullback we've had in copper, I would look, I would look at its, its miners and base metal miners in general um, as a place to be. I don't think they're going to beat gold or the gold miners, but I think they're definitely an alternative place to be. And I think investors and asset managers are recognizing that. No, interesting take on that. Yeah, because I'm always curious, like what uh, Dr. Copper is telling us, right? And uh, yeah, 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 I don't think it's if you go back up, I don't think it's telling you get a good economy, though. OK, yeah, OK, I don't think so. Uh, that notion uh, is uh, it's a flimsy notion. It's a nice concept and it sort of makes sense on the surface that, you know, copper, industrial demand, et cetera. There could be other factors in copper, like supply problems that could also become a problem for silver, by the way, big time. Uh, anyway, yeah, I, I would look, be looking at copper and the base base metals to join gold here. Yeah, Michael, let's let's touch on tech, like with with an H at the okay. end, uh, tech okay. stocks here for a second. Um, a bit of an unfair question, almost, because we've got Nvidia reporting today after uh, after oh, market yeah. close. Yeah. So whatever okay. we say right now could probably be uh, obsolete uh, in in about twenty four yeah. hours when we publish this interview. But uh, let, let's play the hypotheticals. Like, okay. how, how strong is uh, the tech sector? Okay, the tech sector is now suddenly gotten weaker than the S&P 500. Now, the 
te- S&P 500 is also front end weighted with a lot of tech stocks, but to a much lesser percent of weighting than NASDAQ 100. So you can find like four or five stocks in NASDAQ 100 to constitute 50% of its weightings. Top five in the S&P might only constitute 20 or 30% of its weightings. And a lot of those are tech stocks. But <clears throat> as the S&P has been toying just below its high, NASDAQ 100 is not. So yes, it's bounced back from its low a month ago, nicely. But in relation to its prior high, it's not near it compared to the S&P. So there's been some lessening in the spread relationship. So, and NASDAQ's not quite as rebound strong as the S&P's been over the last month. I think that's probably a hint. Tech led the upside on a percentage basis. That's why NASDAQ went up double the multiple gains of the S&P. And therefore, it's the leader. And so if it breaks down, don't pretend that you can go to something like small caps and make money. When the leader goes, the market will go. Just the issue of which, what percent will the others drop as well. And they'll drop to a lesser extent than tech will. If tech had not been the blowout leader, the you know, blow off leader, it wouldn't be suffering so much in the next downside, but it will. So we think NASDAQ will be a place to be short if you're going to be short the stock market. But I don't think there's going to be any sectors that survive it. <clears throat> in other words, a lot of people are talking about small caps and stuff like that. Yeah, they're going to go down less than the front end of the market, but they're going to go down too. But tech is going to lead this on the downside. And if you look at NVIDIA, for example, Stand back and look at a monthly price chart. And you've had a big soar, then a range, and another big soar. And now, if you go sideways for the last three months, you're kissing your sister. Bump, 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 bump. NVIDIA has been in distribution. Right now, we're about 10, 15 bucks from the high. Maybe you make a new high, maybe you don't. I'm suspecting <clears throat> that you hang around through the end of the month. NVIDIA report today probably won't be a shocker. And if it is, you'll rebound anyway. I suspect it'll be good. I think NVIDIA is going to go down, not with bad earnings reports going forward, but simply because it goes down because it's overpriced. And uh, the rest of the tech sector will go with it, of course. But uh, it's behaving like the NASDAQ, where it's just actually for three months, it's gone nowhere. And I think that indicates there's distribution. So if you get a good report today out of NVIDIA and you don't uh, leave the page or if you do try to and you come back down, beware. I think it's priced in all of its good earnings. The issue now is, is it overpriced? Period. No, I've read a headline this morning. I think it says uh, NVIDIA results could spur a record $300 billion swing in shares. That's an insane amount of money. Like, <laughs> just talking about their redistribution and that's just what yeah. popped into my head. So Don't I count on the last thing, you know, whatever. Uh, it's just... You know, there have been so many of these instances where, you know, pretty soon it runs out of potency. It's not a glory day every time there's an earnings report. So if you think that's going to go forever, well, think twice. You know, pretty soon they're priced in in the market. <clears throat> the issue becomes, is it overpriced to its reality? Even if the reality is true, remember the dot-com top? <clears throat> that was the leader sector, was the Internet sector back then. And it went down the most. s and went down 50 percent. NASDAQ 100 went down 82 percent by 2002, led by the dot-com stocks. But the knowledge and the, the view that we had of tech being the great future it was going to be, damn, it was right. Internet was far more revolutionary, changed our lives in positive ways than even the most rampant bulls were telling us back then. But yet the, they, they crashed, or they went down you know, 82% over two years. Why? Pricing. They were overpriced. That's all. Exact same scenario we're seeing right now, in my opinion. Yeah. So exact same scenario. And with that bombshell, Michael, I'm, I'm, I'm going to release you. And uh, really appreciate your time and effort. Really appreciate you making the time to come on SOAR financially. Where can we follow you? Where can we find more of your work? Well, it's OliverMSA.com, Momentum Structural Analysis. This is the site we explain our methodology uh, in pretty good depth with a lot of archived reports. Uh, there's a little humorous video at the bottom of one of those uh, 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 our value, it's called a category. Click on that, scroll, you'll see some discussion of our methodology, which is different from most technical methods. Anyway, uh, we cover all four major asset categories. It's important to look at all four of them because, you know, what Forex is doing now and the stock market's doing and the bond market's doing and gold are doing quite often are in opposite sync and therefore they impact one another. So don't just keep your eyes narrowly focused. Anyway, 
It's going to be an interesting rest of the year. It, it sure is. And we haven't even touched on the impact of the U.S. elections because that's like reading tea leaves. And there is, uh, there is no outcome that will be copacetic. I've been saying that for a year. I don't care who wins. The outcome will not be normal. Yeah. Leave it not, at that. Yeah, okay. exactly. Fantastic. Yeah. Michael, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in here to Soar Financially. If you enjoyed this conversation, do us a big favor, hit that like and subscribe button, turn on the bell notification. That way we can uh, send you, pu- or YouTube sends you push notifications whenever we upload a new video, usually Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. And uh, if you enjoyed the conversation, if you you know, have a comment, put that down below. We're always looking forward to constructive criticism. Uh, what questions should we ask? What is of interest to you? Put that down below. We do want to get better and uh, we're always ready to improve and wanting to improve. So let us know how we can best do that. And uh, by the way, changing the moderator and host of this channel is not an option. So um, we're going to stick to that. And uh, But in the meantime, really appreciate any feedback. Thank you so much for tuning in and uh, we'll be back with lots more here on Soar Financial. Thank you. Thank you.